over uh, to India. Uh, three days, everything is going all well. Fourth day, one of the product managers suddenly started palpitating. Uh, we take him to one of the best corporate hospitals in, in the city. Um, the diagnosis there was not very clear. But one of the things they came back and told us was that he probably had dengue fever. We, I missed certainly Mr. Heartbeat. Uh, the rest of the team did miss the heartbeat. But eventually, I think we figured out we had access to enough healthcare opportunities uh, within the city, and we finally managed to make sure what, what was wrong with it. In 2008, a colleague of mine um, had a family, uh, uh, had a friend or a, a relative in the family who was diagnosed of a cancer of unidentified origin. He went to several hospitals across the country, but still I think the whole point was that he couldn't really identify. He spent a lot of money in trying to find what was wrong, went through several treatments, but the diagnosis wasn't done. In 2009, some of our friends were visiting from the US, and H1N1 was, uh, was all over the world. There was training at, the, uh, at all the airports, which was very commendable. But one of the things was that as soon as the temperature was high enough, and that was the only parameter on which we were testing, this person and the entire family was visiting for the first time was taken to a government hospital in unhygienic conditions, which will certainly make sure that he contracts or she contracts the disease. But imagine, imagine that you are a farmer. You are a farmer living with no access to any sort of health care. You are in one of the cities in India or one of the towns in India, or one of the villages in India, where you don't have any access to doctors. Your, your ratio of doctors over there is 30,000 to 1. You have no access to finance. And you, you earn an annual salary or, or an annual income of, let's say, 10,000 rupees. And suddenly you contract dengue fever, or one of the things. You have no ways of ensuring that the you know, you are, you are getting that uh, because you don't, have, you have no access, you have no idea of what has hit you. And the only time you really start to believe what has happened is when you can't go, go to work. And once you can't go to work, you end up spending so much money and there's a possibility that it was so late, so late at this time that you will probably die at that time. And then you're left with seven people left in your family who have no access to any sort of income. Uh, or if you survive, you probably have no access to finance, and especially if you're in Andhra Pradesh, microfinance will probably not be available going forward, right? So anyway, I think these are just examples of certain things that have come across to me, but I'm sure every single person in this room has some examples or the other way which you can relate to in terms of what has happened in terms of diagnosis as well as treatment. So what I'm trying to do today is that if you look at all these things, it is depressing, and I'm sure that if you look at it, if you prevented it early on in its time, just like you would do in a software product development, you would be able to curtail that. But if you wait for it to go on forever, um, the later you catch it, the more expensive and the more ineffective it is. So when you take diseases like dengue or you take cystiasis, I think the Indian government today officially spends about $50 million on, on those diseases. And that's just official numbers. We all know how different the statistics actually really is. So what we are trying to, what I'm trying to at least think about and explain and talk is uh, a little bit about a radical ways of thinking in terms of how in a country like India we can look at different ways of being able to solve these problems. So this is what I was talking about. When you look at the government, the government has a very high disease burden. There's 20% of the disease burden in the country as opposed to 17% of the population that we are currently living in. Right? So, and also, if you look at where these diseases are, are, are concentrated on, it is definitely in the areas where the socioeconomic conditions are very, very you know, small, like, like the farmer I talked about, who has no access to healthcare, no access to doctors, and so on. The ratio, and this is just an average, is about 1 is to 1,676 doctor to patient ratio. But in rural areas, like uh, the farmer I talked about, the ratio might be as bad as 30,000 to 1. And this is in spite of the fact that we export more doctors than any other nation in the world. 
when we take people, we are living in poor, overcrowded and living conditions and we have a lot of occupational diseases that we have to live with. So all these things, I think when we look at it, the treatment cost many times once you contract a disease is much higher than the annual income of the particular patient. So once you are in there, in that position, you have no, no way but to be in a position where you are constantly repaying loans and you are constantly in a position which will hurt you more than what today the government is doing by stopping microfinance. So these are the two things. When you, how do you combat this whole healthcare issue, right? There is prevention and there is early intervention. So when you look at the prevention part of it, there is definitely a lower healthcare burden for the, uh, for the country and there is better health for the community. But when you look at the early intervention, which is finding it much uh, before, if you can improve the prognosis of that particular disease of those who are already afflicted, that is one. The second is how do you contain the spread of communicable diseases like the H1N1 or, or other uh, similar diseases. So what does this entire thing entitle and what has been done already? I think I talked about it a little bit. When you look at the first part of it, uh, there is the immunization and vaccination programs which I think we have done a fairly tremendous job in terms of how we actually look at the entire immunization and vaccination programs in the country. We have done a lot more of uh, you know, providing a little bit more on the uh, basic sanitation and hygiene and creating awareness. So not only the Indian government, uh, organizations like the WHO, the NGOs that are currently involved have done a lot of work in terms of the polio eradication, uh, containment of filariasis and so on. So that is the, the thumbs up that is there in terms of the prevention. But when you look at the early intervention, where you're looking at screening for high-risk population, that you figure out you know, if there is a specific population that's going to be affected, we are probably definitely nowhere close to uh, being on anywhere close to where it should be. When you look at the compulsory testing uh, during an epidemic outbreak uh, or a prophylactic treatment, we are very, very low on it. So there is very we are unsuccessful in screening except in the case of tuberculosis. And that has been an effort that has been more global, more worldwide. Containment has been a nightmare given a very dense population, and which is why the government has to resort to, to uh, doing things uh, like cur uh, curtailing at the airports and, and many other places, which they did a fantastic job. But it creates a lot of inconvenience for the population. However, when you look at the resource constraint, it is exasperated in the times of an emergency. So when you look at what has been done already, uh, I think this part has been extremely uh, poor, at least in the case of India. And the only reason for doing that is that when you look at prevention, at least on the face of it, it looks like that is an inexpensive, it's scalable, there is no need of an expert really, and therefore the constraint on the resources is very, very small. But when you look at the early intervention, and this is exactly the same as when you're trying to create software, and you find that it is much easier to code and finish something and get the product out, but if you had planned better, uh, that needs a little bit of, uh, of uh, brainstorming, a little bit of uh, resources, that an, a little bit of an additional time that you would spend in trying to get there. But if you do that right, um, you have built a much better, stronger foundation to be able to get to the next thing. But there is a need for much more of an expertise, much more of an equipment. So if you're trying to develop a product, you're trying to brainstorm, you're trying to think about a lot of things that can happen, I think that part is what is currently missing. So if you look at that problem on a much more macro level, I think healthcare in India can only be solved if you have a solution that is affordable, scalable, and easy to use. So you have to re remove that whole need of an expert in population to be able to uh, get to the lowest uh, level of the person that you are trying to solve the problem for. So the solution that we are proposing is that if you're looking at uh, genomic technology, right? if you're looking at the technology that is uh, right now touted as having spent too much money on, but it is now finally getting on to a point where you can, in certain cases, find solutions that are very, very low cost, that are scalable. And if you can create solutions that are portable and solutions that allow you to take that data and transmit it over so you can have access to all that data, I think then we have a winning solution. So when you look at where uh, looking at genomic technology and how you can twist around it to be able to create that low-cost solution. Uh, one is, uh, if you look at just using what is already available globally, I think we are in a market which is slightly different from the rest of the world in the sense that we are 
in a position, not in a position to be able to afford a lot of the things that are currently available outside. So a lot of the kits that are currently used outside have to be manufactured indigenously and with a brain that allows you to think Indian uh, to be able to get to a point where you can really manufacture those indigenously. Uh, you have to question established protocols and thinking out of the box to be able to create that scalability. So one of the things, and, and this was something that uh, as soon as the outbreak was announced, one of the things that uh, we wanted to do as a company that did that was we said, uh, we're going to produce something that's going to be 10 times cheaper than what is there. And I think this is something that we started thinking of, and that was the whole point. You think about an a problem and you think about a completely out of the box solution where you say if this is how it is being done outside, is there a way that I can bring down the cost so that it can be affordable, it can be something that can scale. But if you really look at the experience that, that we've had in terms of coming up with um, a kit that was, uh, that allowed us to re reduce the cost 10 times, I think there is a one step further that we can go which is to be able to create that kit in a much more portable form. But it's not just about being able to create the kit in a portable form. It is to be able to kit the portable kit, which has a wireless capability. And the reason I talk about the wireless capability and the whole cloud computing model was that if you look at the entire model and you look at where the disease outbreaks for these pandemics, as well as other things are happening, I think our problem today is more in terms of being able to collect the right kind of data that we really need. So if you could have a real-time transmission of this data onto a server that we have access to, it is much easier to be able to understand the spread of the disease and to be able to then contain that disease in a much more um, better way. And even better still is to be able to understand that on a genetic basis much earlier to be able to contain some of the other diseases even before they start to happen. So the future can bring us wireless devices that can work over a cloud computing model. I think I think by the time it's next year, I think most of the there will be a lot more tablets out there in the market. But if you look at the tablet models and you look at by combining it with uh, a healthcare uh, application device with it, I think then we have a solution that allows us to be able to capture technology that's been developed for other uh, industries and be able to couple that and be able to get the most effective uh, solution. But of course, you can't use it as, as is. So you have to start thinking about how do you take these devices, make them for a country that, like India, make them cheap enough, um, but make them with technology that can scale for the next few years. So yeah, and once that happens, you, we really will bypass the need for an expert presence in, in rural pockets. And it enables the real-time uh, data collection that can track diseases uh, spread and also effective containment measures. And such data accumulated over a period of time can help with these databases. And what I mean by that is that when once you start collecting this information over the entire country over a period of time, we can now have a very population-specific database that allows us to do much better drug discovery, that allows us to do much more effective screening and much more efficacious treatments and preventive care. And I think that part is what the country needs. And it is not going to be done by simply investing money in, in new therapeutic uh, uh, diseases areas, but it's more in terms of being able to understand disease, being able to understand the origins, and be able to prevent them much quicker and in, in a much more uh, time effective manner. So I think a lot of people say you know, genomics is too, too complicated, too sophisticated. And it's probably, uh, we are 10 years away from um, having anything come close to in, in terms of being anything as, as a therapeutic or in terms of anything that will allow us to be scalable. When you look at that and you look at what happened in the cell phone sector, I think what the government did not do for the rural and telecommunication cell phones uh, revolutionized. And what we mean by this is that for a consumer who typically earns less than $1,000 a year, a large majority of them don't have access to any kind of landline phone networks. They don't have access to toilets. They don't have access to a lot of things that are probably essential and needed. However, when you look at a, a case, and this is one of the cases that we saw, this is something we got from the Wall Street Journal, was that when you take the case of a village in Kandahali, about 40 kilometers from Bangalore, there is a farmer who splurged on a cell phone. 
and the cell phone cost him over $40 um, and it cost him $6 a month every every single month and this is in spite of the fact that he doesn't have access to a lot of the basic necessities he found this necessary and not only necessary I think it allowed him to really increase his own family income over the few years and they started to see the value of this so when you look at that and when you look at the fact that a lot of the cell phones today have really really penetrated in the regular every single person that you meet on the street kind of a space we have to find ways of being able to find similar such things in the healthcare space and when you look at it and if you can understand it from the genetic basis of it come up with a solution that's low uh, low cost and affordable i think that's when you um, you can come to a solution so what the government is unable to do for rural or remote healthcare i think genomics and wireless technology can revolutionize so i think that's uh, the future that is waiting to happen it is waiting to happen once we get all the pieces of it together and we think out of the box and put them together and, and get it so that those were the few points that i would like to uh, wanted to bring up today and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions once we get to the break